Psalm 51 is attributed to David. It's a prayer of healing and renewal. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner of my mother conceived me, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my sacred heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me in a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, will not, you will not despise. With everything else that's going on in the world, you may have missed the news that uh, Maya Angelou is among 20 women who will be honored over the next four years by being included uh, on quarters issued by the U.S. Mint. The news actually broke a year ago, and it, what happened this past week to bring this story back into the news cycle is that the Angelou quarters have started circulating. I was pleased to hear this news. Angelo is certainly deserving of this honor. I'm not sure how they could limit this series to just 20 women. How do you decide which 20 women are going to be honored as remarkable women? Still, I'm was rejoicing about Angelou being on this list. And then I saw a tweet about the release of the coin. The tweet noted that while Angelou will be on the back of the coin, the front of the coin will continue to show a man who enslaved people. That tweet stopped me. It made me ponder. It made me think about George Washington and all the great things that he did, including creating the American presidency. And it made me think about the fact that nonetheless, he enslaved people. As I thought about these things, my mind came back to a truth that is simultaneously simple and complex. None of us is the worst thing we ever did. The worst thing you did no more defines who you are than the worst thing that I ever did defines who I am. We are each much more than a single moment, be that a bad moment or a good moment. 
We are each much more than one choice or even a series of choices that take us down a road of sin or a road of glory. We have a clear example of this in the stories about King David. The David saga starts in the middle of 1 Samuel and continues through all of the rest of the, of the book and all of 2 Samuel, one and a half books to tell his saga, his story. And that fact did make me wonder if one of the reasons that he is looked upon as being the greatest king in Israel's history might be because he had a really good PR team that pumped out lots of information about him. Even though he wasn't the first king or the purest king, or even for that matter, uh, always making great choices king, he is still viewed as the greatest king. And it is from his lineage that the Messiah was expected. There's one particular story in the David saga that I want to remind you of. It's told in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. It's the story of David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. In the story, we read about David spotting Bathsheba bathing. He sends for her, has sexual intercourse with her, and she becomes pregnant. Once David learns about Bathsheba's pregnancy, he sends for her husband, Uriah, who is an officer in the Israel army fighting a war. David has Uriah come back. He tries to convince Uriah to relax within all of the comforts of home, if you know what I mean, in an attempt to cover up the adultery, the pregnancy. And to be honest, I think that that adultery is really more like rape. Uriah refuses to relax in all the comforts of home while his men are facing the hardships of war. So David has Uriah and his men sent on a suicide mission so Uriah will be killed in battle. With Uriah dead, David brings Bathsheba into his home and marries her. Chapter 11 ends with this understatement. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. In 2 Samuel 12, the next chapter, the prophet Nathan confronts David with his sins, the adultery and the murder. It is perhaps worth noting that these two sins are among the list of the 10 big ones, right? In the 10 commandments. Confronted by the truth that Nathan speaks, David acknowledges his sins and repents. In essence, this leader says, I am not okay. At some point, Psalm 51, today's scripture reading, got connected to this episode in David's life. If you look through a book of the Psalms in a reliably translated Bible, you'll notice that some of the Psalms have titles or superscriptions, as the scholars call it. They are frequently musical directions to the choir master with stringed instruments. Sometimes they appear to be attributions of authorship. The idea that David wrote all the Psalms didn't come about until long after the book had come together itself. Some of them might be references to the tune to which a particular Psalm is to be sung. The superscription for Psalm 51 says to the leader, a Psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. While the superscriptions were likely added to the Psalms over the decades and even centuries by various scribes, it is not surprising that this Psalm is associated with the David, Bathsheba, and Uriah story. These are the sorts of words I would hope that a leader would pray when they realize that they are not okay and largely not okay because of the choices they themselves had made. 
The truth of the matter is that these words could and probably should be prayed by any of us when we realize that we are not okay because of the choices that we have made. Now, I know that sin isn't a word that we use very often in this congregation. I think that's because it's a loaded word. It has a lot of excess baggage. I think most of us associate sin with shame. And who wants to feel shame? Feeling embarrassment is bad enough. No, we resist feeling shame, or at least we resist admitting that we feel shame. And so we resist calling sin, sin. And I think that's too bad because sin is a theological concept. Crime and injury are legal and medical concepts. Sin is a description of our relationship with the divine. It is a theological description. To be aware of one's sin is to be aware of the brokenness in one's relationship with God. And to feel guilty about one's sin is to allow oneself to be accountable to God. That accountability need not make one feel shame. Guilt and shame are different. Guilt tells us that we did something bad. Shame tells us that we are bad. Guilt tells the truth. Shame tells lies. So go ahead and resist feeling shame, but don't do so at the expense of feeling guilty, because guilt can be a gift. Guilt tells us when we need healing. Guilt tells us that we need a change of direction. Guilt tells us that we need accountability to God. In fact, I think we can look at Psalm 51 as a model of the path guilt can take us on toward healing. Call it a positive guilt trip. The poem starts with a statement of belief. Now, some people hear this as a heartfelt statement of belief. I hear it as a head thought statement of belief. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. This is something the poet believes and states to harness the courage for this journey. Believes here, but needs to be reminded of it here in the heart. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Still in the head, the poet says, I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Then the poet acknowledges the need for a change. You desire truth in my inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. This I see as the bridge from the head to the heart. This is where I hear the poet feeling what have been thoughts until now. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Transform me so that I can teach transgressors your ways, because this is the broken openness that you want, God. The sacrifice acceptable to you, God, is the broken and contrite heart, a heart that will be transformed by God's love. The poem starts in the head, saying out loud, perhaps more to the poet than to God, a statement of God's steadfast love, that with the poet, we can believe in God's love, we can believe in God's mercy, that will allow us to examine our transgressions and name our sin, and then in honesty, we will open our hearts to God and ask that our hearts be transformed a broken and contrite heart, a heart that can be healed, that can be transformed by God's love, is the heart that will be transformed by God's love. I've read that dogs and cats never truly repent. 
Imagine discovering your dog or your cat has just finished eating a piece of beef tenderloin that you left out on the kitchen counter. When you discover the sin of your pets, you will be presented with dog repentance in the form of Fido approaching you with tail wagging, pleading, love me, love me, love me, love me, love me. Socks, on the other hand, will keep licking her paws and looking up occasionally as if to say, do we have a problem here? Neither dog nor cat really repents. And humans emulate them on a regular basis. Both dog and cat are attempting to restore good feelings to a relationship without addressing the real brokenness that has occurred. Our task then, when we are not okay because of sin, is to address the real brokenness that has occurred. And to give us that courage to do that work, let me conclude with these four reminders. One, none of us, including you and me, is the worst thing we ever did. Two, our brokenness is no match for God's grace. In fact, it seems that acknowledging our helplessness is the very path to God's mercy. Three, grace does not come without grief. For our hearts to heal, we must first be honest about their brokenness. And four, if there was ever a place for us to be honest about our brokenness, it is the church. Amen.